Ah, hello. Ah, sorry, it took me a minute. It's always interesting getting the technology to work the way it should work. Uh, but I'm John Quackenbush uh, from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, it's my honor to be here tonight as part of Bioconference Live. Uh, this is my second uh, year presenting at Bioconference Live, and I'm really looking forward to uh, spending time uh, with all of you tonight. I just want to remind you that there is a uh, question and answer um, place where you can type in questions and at the end of the um, at the end of the session I'll be reading the questions and answering them as they go along. So as things come up please feel uh, free to enter your questions and I'll try to get to them uh, before time runs out. All right. So. Um, Thank you very much uh, for all joining me. I don't know how many people are out there, but uh, I hope there's more than just me. So what I want to do tonight is tell you a little bit about uh, some of the approaches that we've been developing, really integrative approaches to network modeling of biological processes. And uh, what gets me really excited about working in this area is just the fact that we have access to unprecedented quantities of data. And as I started to think about this, I realized that this really provides us with a tremendous opportunity to do something um, really extraordinary and unique. And I started searching for quotes. I like to use quotes in the talks that I give to sort of summarize um, the things that um, I think are really important about what I'm going to presenting. And I think this quote summarizes it perfectly. Every revolution in science, from the Copernican heliocentric model to the rise of statistical and quantum mechanics, from Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection to the theory of the gene, has been driven by one and only one thing, and that's access to data. And um, to be honest, when I looked for a quote, I couldn't find one. So this is actually a quote that I made up. Uh, so you're free to use it. And if you use it enough, then I can actually use it. It'll be a famous quote. Uh, this is my intellectual selfie. But uh, I really think it speaks truth to um, the challenges and the opportunities that are presented by access to data because data allows us to challenge our existing models, to falsify them, to find holes in them, and to develop new models that we can use to try to model and understand the universe. So uh, in biological systems, we've really had a tremendous opportunity because of access to data. And what we've tried to do over time is to use that data uh, at least in the context of biomedical research, to really address what I think of as the life cycle of human disease. That what we'd like to be able to do is to use genetic information to predict disease risk. We'd like to be able to um, use the information we have available uh, to do better a better job of early detection, to be able to stratify patients, and eventually to identify within disease subtypes uh, particular therapies that are most efficacious for those patients. And our overall goal in doing this is to improve outcomes uh, and quality of life for those patients. So the work that we've been doing over the years has largely been driven by access to data from technologies like DNA arrays. But what's been extraordinarily exciting for me is really over the last few years, the availability of much more comprehensive genomic data and in fact, integrated types of genomic data from the same samples that are available through technologies like DNA sequencing technologies. Of course, this data is only part of the entire picture we try to take advantage of, but it's really this increased access to data that's allowed us to be able to think differently about a whole host of different problems. And this is really driven by the falling cost of, of DNA sequencing. If we look at sequencing and sequencing technology, what we've seen is that um, when the first human genome was sequenced in the year 2000, uh, the time required to sequence the genome was still on the order of months. It took teams of people around the world. And the estimated cost at the beginning of 2000 was uh, that sequencing a genome would cost on the order of um, $100 million. Over the next few years, the cost started falling and dropping roughly by a factor of two every 18 months. And uh, this is what everybody calls falling at the same rate as Moore's Law, uh, although Moore's Law says the number of uh, transistors, transistors on a chip doubles every 18 months. And it doesn't quite make sense in the context of sequencing. What it really talks about, though, is a twofold change in something in a relatively small period of time. In this case, a twofold change in sequencing cost every um, 18 months. 
But then in 2007 and 2008, we had the introduction of new sequencing technologies. Um, that second generation, or people like to say next generation, but really that second generation of sequencing technologies. And we went through a phase where the cost of sequencing was dropping by 33% per quarter. And for me as a scientist, this was really phenomenal because it promised that soon we would have access to absolutely massive quantities of data. And to sort of put this in perspective, I always like to think about my own life. Um, in 2009, the cost of sequencing had fallen to about $100,000. And when I look at that, I used to think about this seriously in the context of um, you know, my family and our health. I always used to say if my wife or son had a rare cancer that was refractory to therapy, I'd mortgage our house and sequence their genome. Today, the cost of genome sequencing is approaching $1,000, which means that I can pay for it on a credit card. It's fallen to the point where it's not out of the question for many people to have genomic sequencing performed and for research studies and clinical practices to begin to collect genomic sequence data. The real question is, what do we do with this data and the other types of genomic data that we can generate now so readily? So we have to think about some of the challenges inherent in dealing with these large-scale data sets or what people like to call big data. So um, if you think about big data, there, there are definitely technological challenges in, in just um, collecting it, managing it, storing it. But there are also challenges that go beyond those technical challenges. And the National Research Council here in the U.S. actually commissioned a report uh, on uh, massive data analysis. And the Committee on Massive Data Analysis published a very nice report in 2013 um, in which they looked at the challenges and they said, you know, the challenges go beyond just the technical aspects, although those are not to be ignored. And anybody like me who's wrestled with large-scale data sets knows that these technical challenges are significant. But in fact, one of the key elements in meeting big data's challenge, uh, challenges is the development of rigorous quantitative and statistical methods. That what we have to do is take the data we can collect now and put it into some kind of rational context. There's a, a website that I absolutely love. If you do a Google search for spurious correlations, um, what you can do is on that website look at the massive data that they've collected and find things like correlations between um, uh, the number of U.S. spending on space uh, exploration and the number of uh, deaths by strangulation in bed sheets. That with enough data, you can find correlations that are absolutely meaningless but have extremely high correlation coefficients. And what we have to think about is moving beyond just simple correlation. We have to really think rigorously about new ways of looking at this large scale data and making sense of it. So if you start to think about this, um, what the NRC committee uh, really understood was that we had to start thinking about this whole question of statistical inference, how we take these associations and turn them into meaningful uh, methods that allow us to infer real relationships between elements in the data. And in order to do that, we really have to develop a new statistical rigor uh, that allows us to make the leap from data to knowledge and to really move from knowledge to understanding, that we have to develop new approaches to dealing with absolutely massive data. So that if we don't do that, in fact, we may draw conclusions that are false and potentially uh, harmful. So as my, my, I and my colleagues started to think about this general problem, what we realized was that there were a number of challenges that needed to be addressed. The first was the problem of normalization or pre-processing and detection of hotspots, important features in the data set that we want to try to be able to identify and make sense of. And so we recognize we need methods to compare measurements across sources and to find those salient features. Um, we've dealt with problems with normalization in gene expression analysis, and it's been really interesting uh, to me to see uh, the lessons we've learned in arrays ignored once again in RNA-seq. But in fact, it's not just important in sequencing-based technologies. If we put the same patient in two MRI scanners next to each other, they're not going to give us exactly the same image. And while a trained radiologist may be able to look in and identify a tumor in both of those, really, as we start to deal with um, uh, radiographic data on thousands of patients, we need automated techniques that can compare those, find them, 
and identify their features in a robust and quantitative way. So pre-processing is an important problem. The second one is one of data integration. And again, I think that's something that all of us working in this field have faced, that it's not just genomic data, it's not just imaging data, it may be environmental exposure data, it's clinical data, it's phenotypic data, that in order to get the most out of any individual data set, we often have to add even more. We have to add external sources of information that we can use to build robust models. Or we have to add multiple different types of measurements on our samples in order to make sense of them. The third piece that we identified as being important is that of reproducible research. And what we really have to do is leverage our ability to generate data very rapidly um, in order to be able to validate or invalidate the conclusions that we draw from data. And then finally, and a big part of what I want to talk about in this presentation, is uh, the need to develop new methods that move beyond correlations and capture some of the nonlinear but very important associations that we see um, as being important in biological systems. So I'm going to briefly talk about each one of these, but I'm going to focus on, on the fourth network methods. So um, batch effects and normalization, as I mentioned, are one of the things that we've spent as a field, I think, a lot of time dealing with. And there's a really beautiful paper published a few years ago by Rafael Rosari and some of his colleagues looking at the widespread and critical impact of batch effects and high throughput data. And what they did was they looked at a number of large scale studies, including uh, many of the measurements made in the Cancer Genome Atlas. And what they showed was that in those large scale data sets, even if you performed a pretty reasonable normalization, what you could do, and you can see this in the lower left hand corner of the, the slide, is that you can actually identify some genes uh, in this case that were different between different batches, different between different lots. So even after normalizing the data, there are still residual effects. And that if you focused on those effects, you could actually separate the samples based on um, where they were collected. And they showed in this paper that in fact this was not an unusual phenomenon, that in almost every da large scale data set they looked at, they could identify these batch effects. And while they suggested methods that might work to eliminate them or reduce their severity, um, they, and I think we recognize, that there's still a lot of work to be done to develop more robust methods to handle these batch effects at scale. The second key point we identified was integrative analysis and the need to perform integrative analysis. And in this case, it's really looking at the fact that we can generate multiple different types of data on our samples. So these new technologies, these new sequencing technologies have been absolutely phenomenal for me as a scientist because it allows me not just to look at one aspect or one feature, even of the sequence-based data. We can look at the genome and understand the genetic background. We can look at um, RNA sequencing uh, to measure gene expression levels. We can look at regulatory information from ChIP-seq. We can look at epigenomic data. We can look at proteomics data. And each one of these gives us a complementary view on the biological processes that are underway. But the challenge is that what we'd like to do is take not only those, but phenotypic data to anchor our measurements and the inference that we draw from those measurements um, in order to really uh, draw robust conclusions. But as we start to do that, and in, in particular in a lot of work that we do in a clinical setting, we're dealing with data that's not perfectly um, captured in a way that we can use effectively. So if we look at electronic medical records, which everyone is very excited about, what you discover is that those are designed not to capture um, phenotypic data in a robust way. They're really administrative and billing databases and that most of the interesting data is in the notes fields. In fact, just yesterday or today, there was a very nice story in the New York Times talking about one of the challenges with big data, and that's data wrangling or being a data janitor. How do you take these imprecise data sets and turn them into something that you can actually use and use effectively? But once you do that, you have to recognize there are multiple hidden dependencies in omic data and other types of data, and that we have to identify those and use them as we build our models. Um, so that while we can constrain them using multiple sources of data and information, we don't want to over-constrain them and we don't want to misidentify correlations in the data 
uh, based on dependencies that we didn't know existed. Uh, a third piece is the, the need for reproducible research. And here I just want to briefly mention the fact that large-scale studies are not immune, even from very good groups, are not immune to challenges in effectively collecting data. So in December of last year, uh, my colleagues and I published uh, a paper in Nature uh, describing the inconsistencies in two large, um, uh, very well done pharmacogenomic studies. They were the cancer, uh, cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia uh, from the Broad Institute and the Cancer Genome Project from the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Sanger Institute. And uh, in both of those studies, what the groups did was uh, a gene expression analysis on a large number of cell lines. Uh, they also performed pharmacogenomic screens on a large number of compounds across all of those cell lines. So these are very challenging measurements to make. You have to make um, hundreds of measurements with different doses across thousands of cell, uh, many, many cell lines. And when we looked at the data, what we hoped to be able to do was to build predictive models using one data set and predict drug response on the other data set. As we did that, we ran into problems. And so we started to ask ourselves where those problems might arise. So when we looked at the data, there were 471 cell lines that were in common. And unfortunately, only 15 drugs, but 15 drugs measured on 471 cell lines for the phenotypic response um, that were shared between the two studies. When we looked at this, what we saw was that the gene expression measures were highly concordant, both within studies where they had replicates and between studies. So when we looked at the same cell line, the data were very highly correlated. Um, so that gave us actually a lot of faith in, in the quality of these experiments that I think really speaks to the investment over many years um, uh, made by people in the field to refine both the experimental procedures and the analytical protocols we use for these large-scale gene expression data sets. On the other hand, when you look at the phenotypic measures, what we discovered was that the correlation between the phenotypic measures and the two studies uh, was uh, poor uh, in almost every, uh, every one of the 15 cases we looked at. And uh, I think a big part of the reason for that is just the experimental challenge in trying to fit a sigmoidal response curve to predict the response to increasing doses of these drugs, but to do it at scale where you don't want to uh, give uh, the cell lines doses that are so high all the cells die. And to do it at scale, what typically is done is the doses are given, or very low doses are given, and then one tries to estimate the response. And I think the problem is that those protocols aren't really well standardized. So when we looked at these two studies, the correlation was poor. When we looked at a third study, the correlation in the phenotypic measures there was also poor. And when we tried to deconvolute why, what we showed, or what we discovered was that the third study was actually slightly closer to the one that used the mo the, a more similar protocol, which probably isn't surprising. But there was no way to really see which of the studies was right, which is something uh, the referees and the editors asked us to do. And all we could do is say, well, what this really uh, means is that uh, as a field, we have to go back and look more carefully at the applications of these technologies and really focus on these fundamental questions of standardization, and reproducibility, and normalization. So if you think about an omic biomarker, it's really a feature set and an algorithm. And what we have to do is recognize that in building these predictive biomarkers, we have to be very careful in putting these things together, that we have to do a robust job of separating those features which um, distinguish phenotypes. We also have to carefully select algorithms that we use in order to be able to uh, make predictions that ultimately are going to tell us about the biological systems we're studying. Right. So, I've talked about three of the areas that big data enables, but what I most wanted to talk about today is this whole question of estimating gene regulatory networks, or using biological information and synthesizing it from multiple different measurements to make sense of the systems that we're studying. And I'm going to talk about work, at least initially, that I've done largely with uh, my colleague uh, G.C. Yuan and uh, Kimberly Glass, who is uh, a postdoctoral fellow working with us. She's now uh, a new assistant professor, um, continuing to collaborate with both of us at Harvard Medical School.
So we started to think about networks some time ago. And uh, for a number of years, my group and I have been looking at different ways to estimate networks from biological systems. And one of the things that I always found challenging when we submitted papers was referees would write back and they would say, well, how do we know the network is right? And when you really pushed on the referees, what we often discovered was that they wanted us to be able to say, well, this network look, looks like a network that appears in a textbook. And as we started to look at this question, we realized that that probably didn't make sense. That if we think about a normal um, state of a cell, well, we might talk about sort of the canonical network for that state. That in fact, as we move beyond that, what we could start to see is the network structure changes and changes in different disease states. Now, if you think about that, that actually makes perfect sense. We can have connections that drop out because one gene is no longer expressed or because it's mutated in a way that it can no longer interact with some other gene. But in fact, it can be mutated or expressed uh, in a particular fashion that allows it to create new connections. So that part of the difference in the phenotypes we observe can really be driven by differences in the network topologies. And so that if we look at even two different states of a disease, what we may find and what we ultimately are probably interested in are the changes in that underlying network and the network topology. So we really started to think about this and, and try to think about how we might model systems, uh, produce models of systems that would tell us something about those underlying networks and how they evolve given changes in phenotype. The, the question that GC and uh, Kimby and I decided to look at, uh, and I discussed this quite a bit in collaboration with Curtis Huttenhauer, was the problem of regulation of transcription. Now, what we know about transcriptional events is that in order for a DNA message to be, or DNA, uh, a gene to be turned into a, a protein, that gene first has to be transcribed into RNA. In order for that to happen, we have to have an RNA polymerase bind to the DNA. And as you probably know, that process is facilitated by the binding of multiple transcription factors to the surrounding region, to the region surrounding a gene. So that those transcription factors actually facilitate the recruitment of the uh, RNA polymerase and the creation of an RNA transcript. So as we started to look at this and really think about it, uh, what we came to recognize was that in some way we could model this as a process of communication, that we have transcription factors. And those transcription factors are communicating downstream to their target genes. They're sending a message to that gene that says, turn on. And in discussing this problem, what we realized was that there's a whole um, literature about modeling transmission in networks and communication in networks. And it's an idea in communication theory that's called affinity propagation or message passing. Now, the way this works is that when we think about both the transcription factor and its target, we realize that both of them have to be actively participating in the communication for information to flow, right? A radio transmitter is transmitting, but if your radio is turned off, no information is going to flow into your, um, into your radio. On the other hand, if you turn on the radio and the transmitter is down, no information flows, right? So what we can do is we can model this process by assuming that there's a mathematical function we call the responsibility associated with the transcription factor with the transmitter. It's responsible for communicating with this target. But the target has to be available. The analogy I like to use is that often I'll come home from work and I'll walk in the door, I'll take off my shoes, and as I'm setting my things down, my wife is eager to talk to me and she starts telling me about her day. And unfortunately, um, when she starts, as soon as I walk in the door, I almost never hear what she's saying because I'm starting to put all the pieces together and think about what's going on. So I may catch part of it, but I may not catch all of it. And later she'll say, well, don't you remember I told you this? And I'll, I'll look at her and I'll say, on, with all honesty, you didn't tell me. And she'll say, yes, I did. And of course, being a husband, I know I'm wrong. Uh, but in truth, without an outside observer, there's no simple way of knowing where communications is broken down. Has she failed to tell me or is I, have I failed to hear it? 
So what we can start to do is try to estimate these functions by looking at correlations in their activation because if both um, at the transmitter and receiver are active in a similar way, then we can understand that information is flowing. But if it's not, what we have to rely on is the fact that we have a more complex network so that if communication flows through one channel but not another, we can understand whether communication is broken down either at the transmitter or at one or more of the receivers. So if I tell all you about this and you all understand it perfectly, then we've all done our job. If I tell you about message passing and nobody understands anything, then I failed in transmitting. But if some of you understand it well and some of you don't, then we can actually model that by taking the network of all possible channels of communication and trimming it to reflect where information is really flowed. So that's what we want to try to be able to do. And so we've been using this method that we developed called Panda. And what Panda does is exactly what I described. It takes, it uses the fact that we've sequenced the genome and we have extensive databases of transcription factor motifs. We know where those transcription factors bind. And so we can build a preliminary network essentially representing all possible channels of communication. But what we do then is we take other sources of data. In the case of the first implementation of Panda, gene expression data and protein-protein interaction data. And we use those then for each edge in the network to estimate the responsibility and availability. What that allows us to do is then to update the network model. And then we iterate the process until we converge on a network that we believe best represents the state of the network given the data. So what we try to do is apply that in a number of different situations. And I'm going to tell you about one example. This is actually uh, a comparison of two subtypes of ovarian cancer. Um, if you're familiar with the Cancer Genome Atlas, they identified a number of other subtypes. And I can tell you that we've analyzed those subtypes as well. Um, and we're looking at incorporating additional data types in our analysis of those subtypes. But the first application we had was a simple application just comparing two subtypes. Um, and these two subtypes were described in the 2009 paper that we published in which we found there were differences in gene expression and that those differences were driven by genes associated with angiogenic processes. So uh, when we looked at these, these are actually clinically relevant subtypes. I apologize in the lower right hand or lower left hand corner, it may be difficult to see the differences in survival. But um, the smaller subgroup, the group expressing angiogenesis genes, probably not surprisingly has poorer outcome than the larger non-angiogenic subtype. And then in fact, in the paper, what we did was compared multiple different data sets, in, including data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, and found that across those data sets, 11 different data sets representing um, uh, well over 1,000 patients, that there were differences in survival for those patients who had this angiogenic phenotype, um, or at least were expressing the angiogenic genes. So uh, what we decided to do was to use Panda to test what the differences were in those networks. So we took all of the gene expression data. We didn't uh, take a selected subset of genes. We took all of the data that were available. And we had two subsets, one representing the angiogenic um, subtype, which will always be displayed in red and the non-angiogenic subtype always displayed in blue. And what we did was we took our motif data, we took protein-protein interaction data from public resources, we took that gene expression data, and we built networks for those two. And then we asked ourselves, how do these networks compare to each other? As we did that, what we really uh, focused on were differences in these connections. Right? That that little anecdote I told you earlier about looking at differences in the networks by looking at differences in the edges really came back to us as we started to look at comparing the uh, networks in the angiogenic and non-angiogenic subtypes. And that what we started to realize was the atom of the network, what made one network distinct and different from another, that indivisible unit, was not the genes, but the edges, the connections and that those connections were fundamentally important. And in a lot of ways, whenever I say this now, it seems obvious to me, but at the time, it was a real revelation. So we were very excited to see this, and what we started to do was construct networks 
And so these are the two networks, the angiogenic and non-angiogenic subtype. This is the angiogenic network. This is the non-angiogenic network. You probably can't see very much in looking at these. But what we were able to do was actually identify 10 key transcription factors. And we picked these transcription factors not because we knew they had anything to do with angiogenesis, but in fact, because these were the transcription factors that seemed, based on our modeling, as transmitters to switch their activities more completely, more thoroughly, more profoundly between the two different subtypes. So when we looked at these, we did the first thing everybody does, which is look to see whether or not we can tell a story based on things that are in PubMed. And uh, a former postdoc and colleague of mine, Stefan Bentick, always described this as the process of biopoetry, right? That you take the genes and you tell a beautiful story. So in fact, for every gene that we found, we could tell a story about angiogenesis. But for me, that's not necessarily very convincing uh, because we could probably have done that with any other random set of 10 genes. So what we started to do was to look at the patterns of differential expression, both for the transcription factors and for their downstream targets. And we started to see something very interesting. What we observed was that in many instances, the transcription factors themselves were not differentially expressed, but their targets were. So what that suggested to us is that what we were seeing was actually a change in the transcriptional uh, networks, that the topology of the network was starting to change. And the transcription factors themselves weren't varying. We couldn't have found them in a normal differential expression analysis, but they seemed to be targeting different things. And that in fact, when we looked at patterns of other data like DNA methylation data, they seemed to correlate with um, what we were observing in um, looking at the genes themselves, that the transcription factors didn't seem to undergo profound differences in methylation, but some of their downstream targets did, and in a way that made sense given um, what we were observing in the expression of those downstream targets. So we started to look at this and, and to really think about the patterns of gene activation that we saw. What we saw were genes which we called A plus or A minus, and these were genes that seemed to be only targeted in one subtype, the angiogenic subtype, and either had their expression increase or decrease, because we know transcription factors can be activating or repressing. So we identified those. We identified other, um, trend, other genes that seemed only to be targeted in the non-angiogenic subtype, and again, those were either going up or going down. But then we found classes of genes that actually seemed to be targeted in both but often had different patterns of expression between those. So we call them A plus N minus or N plus A minus, depending on whether they were up or down in the angiogenic or non-angiogenic subtypes. When we looked at those, what we started to see was that in fact each class of genes that we identified could be linked in a very simple way by looking at overrepresentation of GO terms, the biological processes that are known to be associated with driving or inhibiting angiogenesis. So uh, Kimby actually came up with a very nice way of representing this data. We always call it the spirograph. So if you're old enough to remember this toy when you were a kid, you could draw these neat spirals. Um, but really, if you look at this, I think it's a nice way of representing the data because what you can see, if you look sort of at the lower left-hand corner uh, of the spirograph is that they're genes which are only targeted by, in this case, the non-angiogenic subtype. You can find genes that are only targeted in the angiogenic subtype. But what you start to see are complex patterns of regulation where genes are targeted by two or more of these 10 key transcription factors. So what we did was we started to look at those. And what we discovered was that the number of pairs of transcription factors that were targeting a gene were far, far greater than we would have expected by chance. So again, we started to think about this combinatorial, this problem of combinatorial regulation. And one of the things we came to realize was that this, uh, these patterns of regulation might in fact be informative. And so we started to think about those and the way in which different sets of interacting transcription factors interact um, to stimulate the expression of genes. And one of the very interesting things we saw was that there are actually drugs 
that can interfere with the dimerization of transcription factors or change the methylation state of the genome that are known to interfere with angiogenesis. So our model, which is based on comparing two sets of, of genome-wide expression profiles, led us to identify therapeutic interventions that are supported in the literature, but that really come from looking at the network interactions in these models. So we try to find direct experimental evidence to support this. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any of these compounds that had been applied in ovarian cancer cell lines. But one of the interesting things we found was an angiogenesis inhibitor that was used in uh, a breast cancer cell line. And what we found was exactly the pattern of gene expression that we would have predicted based on our model, uh, looking at these different classes of um, regulated genes. So while we haven't yet been able to fully experimentally validate these findings, what we found is a great deal of supporting evidence that suggests that these models are capturing an essential feature that tells us something about how regulation of genes is associated with phenotype. And it's a model that's derived by really integrating and synthesizing multiple types of data. So we're very excited about the potential and where we think this can go. The second type of analysis, though, that I want to take some time and tell you about, and this is work really focused on integrating two different types of data. So what we want to do is we want to look at expressed quantitative trait loci, or uh, the association between genomic variants and gene expression. So eQTL analysis is um, actually based on an older uh, type of genomic analysis called QTL analysis or quantitative trait locus analysis. Um, it was first developed actually in agriculture looking at selective breeding, marker-assisted breeding in tomatoes. And what um, uh, the developers were trying to do was find genetic markers that were associated with quantitative traits so that each one of the markers could in some way influence the traits and that a collection of the appropriate markers would actually cause traits like uh, tomato color or fruit size or water content um, to vary and that by identifying those traits one could select um, uh, offspring from crosses or direct crosses that would try to improve those traits. So, uh, it was about 10 or 11 years ago uh, that a group, I think, largely uh, led by uh, Eric Schatt, started to think about how one might look at gene expression as a quantitative trait. And so an eQTL is simply looking at measured expression values as a quantitative trait that we hope to be able to associate with um, a set of genetic markers. So what we wanted to do was to use not one data set, but again, it, it, more than one, in this case, two data sets collected on the same samples. Um, so we wanted to look at genome-wide SNP data and gene expression data together. And we were going to treat gene expression as a quantitative trait, really asking which SNPs, which genetic variants, are correlated with the degree of gene expression. So in the analysis, uh, this type of analysis, what most people have concentrated on are cis-acting SNPs, SNPs in the genome that are close to the gene that they regulate. And a big part of the reason uh, for the focus on cis-acting SNPs is that these are the ones that can be tested easily in, ex in an experimental setting. That what one might be able to do is to modify, say, a transcription factor binding site associated with a SNP and look at the downstream effects. But we recognize there are also transacting SNPs, SNPs that are acting at a great distance, even on different chromosomes in the genome, that somehow regulate gene expression. And you can begin to hypothesize a whole host of different mechanisms by which those interactions can occur. But we were simply looking for that statistical association between SNPs and uh, this quantitative trait gene expression. So, um, what we decided to try to do was to really look at these eQTLs in a slightly different way, that what we should look for are SNPs that regulate biological processes. We should have groups of SNPs and groups of genes that somehow interact with each other to regulate functions in the cell. 
that in complex traits, it probably wasn't enough simply to look at a family of SNPs regulating a single gene, but that there was some kind of association between them. And that's what we thought we might be able to find. So we did a fairly standard EQTL analysis. In fact, the first EQTL analysis we ran was using Plink, a widely used, freely available software tool. And what we did was we looked for um, that association between SNPs and genes. So we started to ask ourselves, how are SNPs uh, associated with the expression levels of these individual genes? And what can we say about them? Or more importantly, can a network of SNP gene associations tell us something important about the functional role of these SNPs? And really, that's what we were trying to get at. Could we identify SNPs? that had been found through genome-wide association studies for which there was no clear mechanism and tie them to some mechanism that we could begin to use to understand disease processes. So this idea germinated for a while and then John Plattig, um, who studied network physics as part of his PhD, came to work with me at Dana-Farber. And what we decided to do was to think about the association between genes and SNPs and the networks that we could build by running well-established software tools like Plink to look at those networks and actually think about those networks in a different way, to treat them as bipartite graphs. And a bipartite graph is a pretty simple idea, a pretty simple way of representing complex relationships. So what we can think about in a bipartite graph is we simply have two types of nodes, two types of objects that are connected together. In the case of the slide, we have circles and we have squares. And in our representation here, the squares are SNPs and the circles are genes. So the only way I would potentially modify this diagram would be to draw arrows going from the SNPs to the genes because those SNPs are regulating the genes in our model, not the other way around. So if we build a model like that, can we start to tease apart some of these groups, some of these associations? So we first said, well, if we build this model, what does the model look like? And so we started to think about the structure of networks. And for those of you who have studied networks, one of the key features that everyone looks at in networks are the nodes. And one of the things we've all come to sort of believe as part of the lore is that networks in biological systems, naturally occurring networks, should at least be consistent with a power law distribution, right? That we should have this scale-free property. This, uh, if we make a log-log plot of the density of connections or the degree distribution, that what we should see is something that looks roughly like this. So we took data from a project that we've been involved with, uh, the Lung Genomics Research Consortium, or LGRC. This was a large consortium um, in which there were over 1,400 samples that had been collected at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, those samples were provided to, um, as part of a, a study called the Lung Tissue Research Consortium. They were provided to us as part of the Lung Genomics Research Consortium. And they had multiple different genomic assays run on the same samples. So we had genome-wide SNP profiles, but we also had genome-wide expression profiles. So what we did was we looked at the networks, and what we found in this model of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, that the, the SNPs, the genes, and the combined network had this kind of log linear, or, uh, uh, this kind of linear relationship on a log-log graph that people associate with these scale-free networks, or what John more properly has told me is called uh, a fat-tailed distribution. So that when we look at the network, what most people focus on is down in the lower right-hand corner. It's that collection of highly connected SNPs, highly connected elements that have many, many connections within that network itself. And so our first hypothesis in looking at this network was that that might be the, that might be the area in which we'd find uh, disease-associated genes, or excuse me, disease-associated SNPs. So when we started to look at the, the tail end of this distribution and search for SNPs that had been found through GWAS studies or had been cataloged in the NIH GWAS catalog, 
What we found was that rather than being enriched for SNPs, that area of the distribution was actually depleted for SNPs. So we went back and started to think about the, the network and the structure of the underlying network and what that might tell us. All right? So this raises a second sort of important issue in our thinking about biological networks. And that's how the networks themselves are physically constructed. And the analogy I like to use here is that if you think about the cell phone network, right? All of you are in principle connected to everyone else in the world. Everybody out there with a cell phone in principle can call me. They can send me text messages. They can reach out to me. In practice, almost none of you do. So I don't know who's actually listening in. Somebody may be one of my friends who calls me. But most of you are probably not um, one of my contacts, um, one of the people I'm in contact in, in a regular day. And so if you think about it, you actually have a network. That, that network, that community, is defined by a group of people who you call, who are more likely to call each other and to call you than they are to call me, right? So it's that interconnectivity in your own social network, your own social group, that defines your community. And if you're like me, you probably have a work community, right? A weekday community and a friends and family weekend community. And in fact, by looking at the structure of the community any instant in time, I could probably predict whether it's a weekend or a weekday where you are. Right? So that structure of the network, the way the network is put together, is actually very important for understanding the state of the system. And so the idea that John and I started kicking around was that one might be able to look at this network and actually look at its community structure. So uh, I mentioned John has a background in network physics. He actually did his PhD with Michelle Gervin. Um, Michelle is one of the experts, world's experts in community structure and networks. And there are a whole host of community structure algorithms that have been developed over the years. And essentially what they do is they look for subsets of the network where the connectivity within that subset is much stronger than it is to other elements of the network. So what one can do is actually define a metric for identifying communities. And as I mentioned, there are a number of algorithms that do that. And then begin to look for the definition of those communities. So uh, there are actually challenges in doing this. Uh, there are statistical challenges in dealing with large networks. Uh, and there are also challenges in dealing with bipartite networks and really coming up with a good model for estimating whether the number of connections are greater than what one would expect, expect by chance. If you begin to work through these, though, what you discover is that there are actually communities within these networks. There are groups of genes and groups of SNPs that are more highly connected to each other than they are to the rest of the network. And again, this really sort of speaks to my intuition about how networks might work and how biological systems work. That while we can think of a few single genetic variants that are strongly associated with phenotype, in fact, probably what we have are families of SNPs that are co-regulating, right, or somehow conspiring to regulate or cooperating to regulate families of genes. So you can ask, if we look at these different communities we find in our networks, are they overrepresented for different biological processes? The answer is, using simple Go term analysis, yes. And if you start to look at the different communities, you find that the different communities represent different processes. And in the case of looking at COPD, these are different biological processes that, in fact, make sense in the context of understanding the development and progression of the disease. So as we started to work through um, our thinking about the overall problem of looking at networks and looking at the connection between SNPs and genes, we came back to this question of where the disease SNPs are located. And what John started to do was to look at the local connectivity. Because if we think about hubs, maybe it's not the global hub. Maybe it's the local hub, the SNP that perturbs a process that's most important. And so we started to ask ourselves, how does this local connectivity tell us about the likelihood of identifying disease-associated SNPs? And what we've discovered is that this community structure is actually important. 
we asked ourselves, are the disease skips skewed toward the top of the list, the most highly connected SNPs? And the answer is no, that those highly connected SNPs at the tail of that distribution are almost devoid of disease-associated SNPs. That in fact, um, I would guess that those highly connected SNPs are selected against being disease-associated. Because if you think about it, if I have a SNP that's connected to lots of different processes across the genome, if that SNP is highly deleterious, then chances are it would be selected against. On the other hand, if you look at the communities and ask, are the highly connected SNPs within the communities associated with disease? The answer is yes. That in fact, depending on what statistical test you use, there's a level of significance, but every test we've used has told us that those highly connected local SNPs are the ones that are most likely to be disease associated. And again, that speaks to your intuition because what we're starting to think about is that it's not a SNP disrupting a gene, it's a, one or more SNPs disrupting a process. And that disease is developed not when the whole cell falls apart, but when specific processes are disrupted in very specific ways. So if you think about this, by integrating different sources of data and creating a network model, what we've been able to do is actually start to identify potential disease associations for large numbers of SNPs, many of which have been found in GWAS studies as being weakly associated with disease. So for us, this is a really exciting potential new discovery about a method that can shed light on interesting biological processes. So I open with a quote, now I'll close with two quotes, these from real thinkers, not me. Um, the first is one of my favorites, is from William Gibson, a, a science fiction author. He said, the future is here, it's just not widely distributed yet. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you believe this is the future, it's now a little bit more broadly distributed. And um, the second is one of my favorites, this is actually from Enrico Fermi. Uh, those of you who know me uh, know I did a PhD in physics, and so I always like to say that physicists are the smartest people. Uh, but this is a quote from Fermi, and Fermi said, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. After listening to your lecture, I'm still confused, but at a higher level. So I want to thank you all. I really wanted to try to wrap up a few minutes before the end, because I know people have other things and there are other presentations. Uh, but in the few remaining minutes, for those of you who want to stay around, um, I'll be happy to answer questions. So uh, thank you very much, and um, now I'll begin to uh, look through uh, the questions. All right. So the first question, can the PANDA method be used for more than two groups? And uh, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Uh, one of the things we've been uh, very happy about with PANDA is that what 